our prayerful attention to is in the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find help, grace to help us in our time of need. God's word to us this evening. Our reading begins talking to us about the, the magnitude of the greatness of Jesus, our, our good and wonderful great high priest. And we need that because like the people in the book of Hebrews, life is not always so easy. We are sorely tempted and we are too easily, too readily inclined to do all the, the wrong things at all the wrong times. The book of Hebrews was written to help the people, these Jewish believers in Christ, to stand firm in a time of persecution. These were people who had grown up in the, uh, the Jewish faith. We are reminded, of course, that Jesus was a Jew and that he was the one who came in fulfillment of Jewish Old Testament prophecy. And uh, the Jews were seeped in all of the Old Testament ceremonial law and all the traditions and customs and the people of Israel, uh, especially after the time of the Babylonian captivity, 586 BC and after that, they were trying a little too hard to make sure that they were doing all the right things. You can try too hard. What happened was that they realized they'd gotten in trouble for not being faithful. And so during that time period when they had the beginning for the first time of sermons that we know of in synagogues, and that was the origin of synagogues in Babylon, and it was also the origin of, of uh, preaching sermons that was uh, began as an explanation of, of, a, of a Hebrew text that the people there in Babylon no longer understood. So they would read the text in Hebrew, and then they would re read it in Aramaic, uh, the, the language of Babylon, and then the pastor, the rabbi, which means my teacher, he would explain it to them, and that's still what we do today. Uh, sermons are really a, they are a, uh, an explaining and an application of what God is saying to us in Scripture. And they needed that message just as we do. They needed to be strengthened just as we do because there were so many things working against their faith. Uh, one was the Jews who thought they had lost their minds to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Jews readily uh, then and now believe that Jesus could not have been the Messiah because he did not drive out the Romans and establish an, an earthly kingdom that is what they thought the Messiah was going to do. Jesus came and instead he, he preached to people who were in sore need of forgiveness, like prostitutes and tax collectors, and he was accused by them of spending his time with all the wrong kind of people, people like us. And then there were the Romans. The Romans were, were pagans, and they were people who were encouraged to follow after the Roman emperor who they believed to be Lord and God. And many Christians in the early church were tempted to burn incense uh, before those statues of the emperors, and they came back to church after that, and they found themselves not entirely welcome in church because other people had died rather than to falsify their faith, and others were willing to uh, set it aside for the sake of expediency. That's not exactly dead, is it? How many times do we do the expedient thing? And so when they came back, they, they were not welcomed into the church with everybody else. That's why we have this place called the nave, and the place that's the anteroom to the place of worship they called the, the narthex. And sometimes in the early church, it would take 20 years or more for people to believe that those who were called lapses, who had denied their faith publicly, were actually serious about being believing Christians. And that's where Ash Wednesday came from that we celebrated last week, where they put ashes on the forehead of the people who had been lapsed 
to welcome them back into the fellowship of the church again and to uh, and finally got to the point where people said well we're all sinners so could we have ashes too and it became a practice throughout the church in the western church the uh, text that we have before us tonight is one that if you look in old time king james version bibles oftentimes it'll say the uh, the epistle of paul to the hebrews and now we tend to say that that's not really the case and i know this because in seminary i signed up in seminary to study take an exegetical course a bible study course on the book of hebrews and i have this box of a thousand uh, memory cards vocabulary cards and i started pulling out all the ones that according to the textbook were special words that were used only in the letter to the hebrews and it turned out that if there were 154 words that only the author of the Hebrews used. So I dropped the course and took the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and haven't gotten to the point of going through the whole thing in Greek. Uh, uh, you, if you learn about 315 words in Greek, you can read about 80% of the New Testament is pretty good. There are only about 5,423 different words in the New Testament. Uh, it's a lot different than in modern day English. In modern day English we have about 750,000 words. So we have a lot more words at our disposal. One reason we know that this was not written by Paul, who wrote, the other, wrote 13 other letters, is because the vocabulary is quite different. The style is quite different. And uh, when God inspired scripture, he used the words that people knew to write. He didn't have people like John, you know, write down by God's inspiration words that he had never heard of before. So he was writing on the page and saying, huh, I wonder what that means. That's not how it happened. Okay, so God used the words of the people that, that, that they knew and the author of Hebrews knew a lot of extra words that other people in the New Testament did not, did not use. And it's a wonderful book because it tells us about the all-sufficiency of Christ. That the Old Testament was wonderful, but it pointed to the coming of Christ. And Moses was wonderful, but he pointed to the coming of Christ. And the Gospel is, is of infinite greater value because even though we are given lots of law, we cannot fulfill the law. Not for a moment. On a Sunday morning in our church back in West Des Moines, we're doing a study of Christian denominations. And something we're going to look at on Sunday morning, starting on Sunday, is the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church believes that if you're going to receive the Lord's Supper that they call the Eucharist, you need to not have sinned, at least in any significant way, before you come, since you've confessed to the priest, before you come up to the altar to receive the Lord's Supper. Luther did something different 500 years ago. He put confession and absolution normally in the worship service, not something you did the day or the week before. And I like that because if we really had to be 100% without sin after confessing, even if we do it at the beginning of a worship service, how are we going to do it? On the way up, I'd probably think, what an ugly dress. And I'd go, oh, no. <laughs> and I would never commune. <laughs> All we are is people in desperate need of God's mercy, and that's, that's, that's what God has done for us. We are reminded of all the different ways that, uh, that we have been tempted in our lives, just as Peter was. We read about his temptation, and he was there in the courtyard warming himself in a, in a cold evening, waiting for Jesus, who was being tried by Caiaphas, wondering what was going to happen, wondering if he was going to be sentenced to death wondering what the outcome would be. And a, a number of questions were asked of him. And his answers got more and more vehement, where he said, I do not know the man. And finally he started to swear an oath to that, that effect. I do not know this, this man. And then when finally Jesus turned around and looked at him, Peter realized what he had done, and he went out and he wept bitterly. And how many times have we done the same thing? Denied God in so many different ways, not even perhaps realizing at the time 
altogether what we're doing or thinking that maybe it doesn't matter. Some people think the gospel, that we are forgiven because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, they think that it's license. That we can sin all we want, and then we can always go back and tell God we're sorry, and it'll be fine. But the author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 10, verse 26, that if you go ahead and you just chase after sin, that there is no longer any sacrifice for sin, but only a vivid expectation of judgment that will destroy the enemies of God. Do you really think you can have it both ways? Yes, we're sinners. Yes, we can never be perfect. No, we can never fully follow God the way that we should. But we should, should certainly, by the grace and mercy of God and the Holy Spirit working through His Word and working in our lives, we should certainly make a good effort. And sometimes we're kind of wimping out on this one when, we, when God does not really understand why it does not matter more to us than sometimes it does to be a Christian. But Jesus is somebody who understands. And even when our what we say and our lifestyle and our behavior is a denial of Christ in so many ways, we have a Savior who sympathizes with us, as we read here in Hebrews chapter 4. He understands. And that word sympathize is a wonderful word. It comes from a Greek word that sounds very similar. The first part of it, su, means with. And the last part of it, pasco, uh, that part means to suffer. To sympathize does not mean simply that we understand. It means we suffer right along with the person we're sympathizing with. It's empathy. It's more than just what we think of as being sympathy. Jesus suffers right along with us. And we read about how Jesus was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was bleeding through his pores, drops as of drops of blood. And it's interesting that the one who told us about that, who relayed that message to us, was Luke, the doctor in his gospel. He understood that somebody who did such things was very close on the verge of death. Jesus in the garden already was suffering for our sins. It was not the, com the completion of his suffering, but we talk about the whole thing being his passion. Not just the time on the cross, not just the few hours that he was there. He understands. But it was more than kneeling down and praying in anguish in the garden. His sympathy, his empathy for you and for all sinners like us went all the way to going to the cross. And we have a hard time really fully understanding and appreciating what that involved. Crucifixion was something that it was invented around the time 500. About 500 years after David talked about it in Psalm 22 and described crucifixion, pretty good trick, describing it 500 years in advance. It's exactly what, what Isaiah, the prophet, described in Isaiah chapter 53, when again he described crucifixion a couple of centuries before under Darius, king of Persia, they had invented the thing. And he talks there about the kind of anguish that he would go through. But there's another part of it that is beyond just the physical part of having spikes nailed through your wrists and through your heels, which is how they did it. I had a, I had a shot through my heel one time for foot problems. I was crazy enough to have it done a second time. I must have lost my mind. I've never had anything that comes close to being that painful before. And, and by the way, no, I'm never doing it again. <laughs> but Jesus had spikes through his heels. Nothing, nothing, nothing can be more terribly painful, but in Psalm 22, verse 1, which Jesus quoted on the cross, he also talked about something else even worse. He said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. What does that mean? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is hell? What does hell consist of? Well, God in his mercy has not fully explained it. If you want a really full explanation of hell, read the Quran, which we don't actually believe was inspired, by the way. But, but in there it says that hell is a place where your skin is burned off every day 
so that God can then renew it and burn it off again. Well, there's something worse than that. And that is being without the fellowship of God for all eternity while realizing what that would involve. We don't know all the details of what heaven is like and hell is like, but what we do know is heaven is being with God in all of the vivid beauty of his presence forever. Uh, we're also with loved ones, because it talks about uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob gathering together at table and, and all of this, probably having uh, lunafisk. <laughs> but uh, so we gather with each other, but the vivid beauty of heaven is being with the Lord God. Um, for me in life, the most wonderful thing in life apart from life with God is just being with my wife and having her talk to me, and I think that's as good as it gets. I, I, I tell you, I, it's, it's been 43 years I've known her and it never gets old, but to be with God is infinitely better than the best experience you've had in your life. How could God even describe it with sufficient clarity in the Bible? But, uh, but in our weakness, in so many ways, we deny God. Look at what Peter did. We read about, um, for example, in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And, and the disciples said, well, some say that John the Baptist, you know, some say, you know, I had different responses. Maybe, maybe the prophet described in Deuteronomy chapter 18, you know, they're not too sure. And then he said, who do you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter stood up and he gave a good confession. He said, you are the son of the living God. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter, on, on this rock, this rock of faith that you've confessed. And Peter means rock as well. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he started talking about about going to the cross and suffering and dying. And what did Peter do? He said, oh no, may this never happen to you. And he became the great Satan, Satan, he became the one who was the adversary acting against Jesus and trying to turn him away from that course of action. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. What do we need most in life? Sometimes we think it's a new TV set. We have lots of ideas about the thing that we know we will be, will, be, will be desperately happy if only we have. And I'll tell you a clue, none of those things really work. None of those things really work. The thing we need most is fellowship with God and the mercy that he came to give us. We are tempted to turn away from sometimes family members and friends and we, we follow after their way and we decide it's too too difficult to be a Christian. I've, I've been a pastor for 35 years and I've seen that happen. People decided it wasn't worth it. I guarantee the one thing it is, is worth it to believe in Jesus. Sometimes things happen where people suffer and they think that it's not worth it. I had a friend back in Denver years ago who had back problems and a whole series of surgeries and finally he died of, uh, of bone cancer. <clears throat> And he got to the point where he would tell me he just couldn't believe in a God that would let those things happen. And when we have a time of suffering, that's kind of a fork in the road where we, we can either decide that God is not somebody we can trust or that we realize we need him more than ever, which is really the right conclusion, the one we ought to draw. That's not the one that he was drawing. And sometimes it just seems like the burdens in life are too heavy to bear. Husbands and wives, parents, children, so many situations in life where we think we just can't take it anymore. By the time I get home in the evening and, you know, get dinner on the table and, and spend time with the kids and, and do some of the things I have to do, it's time to go to bed again and get up early in the morning and, and then the boss is upset with me and on and on and on, all the things that happen every day, right? I hear stories from people about the kind of lies they have. I'll give you a clue. Being pastors, are not, it's not the easiest thing either. I used to think it was like heaven to be a pastor of a church. I really don't know what I was thinking at that moment. Uh, sometimes it's a little tough because the people in the church all have the same thing in common. Uh, they're all sinners. 
And none of us really in our hearts of hearts really want to believe what the Bible tells us, especially when we don't like what it says. Uh, the devil is a liar. And he tells us, if only, if only, if only, we'd be happy. And sometimes we believe him and we should never believe anything he says. But Jesus, we're told, is the one who is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray because he himself was subject to weakness. Jesus understands being without sin, but fully human. Um, he's the one who understands everything we're going through in life. He does not give us the cold shoulder. He did not reject Peter when, he, when Peter rejected him. And later on, when I was in Israel a couple years ago, we went to the beach that's thought to be the place where, where Jesus talked with Peter at the end of the Gospel of John and said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then he asked one more time. He said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, I love you. You know what was going on there in that whole scenario? Jesus said to him, do you agape me? Do you unselfishly love me? And Peter said, you're my friend. And Jesus said, do you unselfishly love me? And Peter said, not understanding, you're my friend. And so finally, Jesus said, all right, are you my friend? And Peter said, yes, you know all things, you know I'm your friend. Jesus could have and had reason to just turn away. Sometimes we do that. I've heard from people that say, I just can't forgive that person. Well, who would that be? God is the one who works in our hearts, and Jesus says, if you will not forgive, forgive others, how is God going to forgive you? If we don't value the forgiveness that we receive, how are we going to extend that same forgiveness to other people around us? And so here we have Jesus in all his majesty preparing to go to the cross to be our great divine high priest and also the one who loves us enough and who understands us well enough to be able to, to not turn away from us. And he's the one who has strength in his word, who gives us his powerful word, that makes things different. Uh, that word of God that is so often neglected in our dusty Bibles that we don't pick up very often. I'll just keep saying it over and over again. The most important thing you do every, every, every single day is to read your Bible and to pray. And it's good if you do it first, because otherwise it's likely not to happen. But prayer is something that is a wonderful, beautiful thing. And the Bible promises in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that, that when you read the Bible, when you absorb that word of God that the Holy Spirit works in, that God is strengthening you in your faith by that. Do you really think that temptation is so easy that you don't need it? Take my word for it. I know I've known a number, a number of members of churches over the years that are no longer Christians. You need it more than you think you do, and God will listen to your prayer. Don't think that uh, don't think that you don't need it. But also, prayer is the other thing, and uh, there's even special ways that the Bible gives us, and that we have from ancient Christian tradition that Luther talks about. For example in a letter that he wrote to his barber on how to pray. And the first part of prayer, the way that he talks about it, is to, uh, is to read scripture. You start by reading scripture. And then the second thing is you think about that text you just read. And you can't keep thinking about it and keep looking at it and take it to heart. And then finally to, to pray a prayer, as Luther talked about doing, as he talked to his barber, uh, and it could include things like adoration and thanksgiving and confession and various petitions to God. And then finally, to just be silent before God. Don't just let it sink in. And sometimes Luther would say that he, that he learned more in, in just a short time of just pondering God's word, letting it just sink in a little more deeply than by hours of study. Something to think about. Are you stressed in life? Are you tempted? Do you struggle sometimes? There God's word is, and there is prayer 
to give you the strength as you take to heart what God has said to us and what he said to us is that know that even though we don't deserve to be forgiven and even though we don't deserve to go to heaven we are forgiven because of Jesus our great high priest in Jesus name amen we wait upon you for this evening's offer